Hello, hello, hello. This was a lovely intro, Brett. But it was muted. I didn't hear you. What did you say? <laughs> was this on purpose? Uh, I, I realized I was muted. So I'll start again. I said, yeah. would you chew on a kangaroo? Would you take a bite of bison? Would you consider a course of horse? <laughs> um, most of them I probably would. However, with some of them, I would have to contemplate it maybe a little bit. Oh. The kangaroo, I'm not sure. Maybe. Who knows? Yeah. But what would you? where would you draw the line? Well, that is very dependent on what my upbringing and history and cultural background is i guess um it, it might be interesting to know that people uh, for listeners or watchers to uh know that kangaroo for example is actually illegal especially in california in the u.s it is um, illegal 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 to uh sell kangaroo skins um import kangaroo meat and so um but it came about because a in the 70s a uh, partner of a governor decided that um to i guess impose some kind of iconic animal ban um and the idea is that it's around iconic animals so some whatever what people see as iconic and you'll see in the in in the cover that i made for this uh for this episode you see the coat of arms the australia we joke that australia is the only country that eats both its animals on the coat of arms um and that some people might say is iconic. Consider eating the the eagle for an American. Bald-headed eagle, that would be, I think you go to prison for a long time. Right. <laughs> so, so this is what we're talking about today. We're talking about food taboos. What in your upbringing, what in your cultural background um, mm. makes you eat something or not eat something? And, uh, and, and that's, I think, an interesting question, probably. Something we it, can be, report, it can right? be. Yeah. Well, yeah. well, first of all, happy Monday, everybody. This is the, what is it, 61st episode. We're going into week number, oh gosh, I'm bad at math, uh, but math. We're going into a new week. This is this is what it is. And we're going, to talk, we're going to talk about food. And Sue has eaten all the things you suggested, Brett, and she also ate guinea pig in Peru, which is yeah quite a del delicacy and uh, a special treat if you're invited to a guinea pig meal. They don't cook that every time for just a random visitor. No. Um, she also thinks it's interesting about the eagle. And she's had this one animal that I have a hard time pronouncing. How does she, how do you call it? <laughs> Emu, I believe. Emu. Right? <laughs> uh, it tastes Emu. like chicken, of course. Uh, I think there's an emoji, the tongue in cheek emoji missing, Sue. Um, Deborah says, bison horse milk, so why not kangaroo? Also oh. had crickets and some other insect. Very dry, all right. So here, here we go. So what is a taboo or unusual for some might be just a regular fare for another corner of the world. And I, you know what, I, I, I sometimes found that really interesting where people would draw the line. Because I remember when I was younger, when I was a, like a, a preteen and our parents would take my brother and I on, on family outings or we would travel to maybe Italy or to what was then Yugoslavia. So the Adriatic coast would, was close for us, right? So we would, um, we would be introduced to all kinds of seafood that I had never seen before, which was plated with all the shells around it right in front of us. Um, I remember being in, a, in, in Istria, in what is now Croatia, in one of those fishing villages, and we went into a restaurant, and there was no menu. I didn't speak Serbo-Croatian, and we just went in there, and we got what was the catch of the day, and out comes this huge plate, like family style, for the entire table of 
cooked octopus. And I, I'm, I mean, I, as a kid, I knew what an octopus was. I had never thought about eating one or mind you put it in my mouth before so there it sat in front of us and i was hungry so the inhibition that i may have had in the beginning gave way to the grumbling in my in my groin right so i said okay it's either this or we're gonna sleep hungry what's it gonna be so I, as as a young person as a child i i was it, for me it was easier to overcome certain mental barriers in this now as an adult i think I'm pretty clear on what it is i would tolerate on my table and what i probably wouldn't eat mm. so is it is it an age thing that we in our formative years we, we begin to build those filters of what we find tolerable or not how do you feel about that well i mean if i use the the, the aspect of, of culture so if, so culture where i'm from so we get back to the kangaroo thing sorry to harp on the poor old kangaroo but you know the aboriginal people ate kangaroo and harvested kangaroo for food long before the white man came along and only only we put the restrictions on it or the or thought about it might be restricted um and so it was a natural part of the the cycle of life and that was a cultural thing for so for right. aboriginal people it is something that you do for survival, pure survival. Um, in, in, then you've got the cultural side of it uh, driven by religion. There is a lot of religions which actually put bans on particular foods um, to say that you not, not, not to eat the food altogether or in some cases not to eat the food on a particular day. So mm. um, those kind of things. So these are taboos. The actual comfort with it sometimes, uh, uh, and you referred to, you sent me a great, um, a great article about this, is it goes back to a, a story about a, a, a small fishing area, which there was a, a tendency for a lot of the people to be allergic to seafood. <laughs> that was terrible, right? So even in a fishing village where they harvested the the abundance of the uh, of the area they were around, they ate very little of it because there was this um, historical tendency for a large proportion of the population to be allergic to it. So therefore, a lot of people just didn't eat it. They didn't serve it to their friends and family when they visited. And that became a taboo. So even mm. in a fishing village, we do not eat seafood. We don't eat shellfish. I think it was shellfish. Because of the shared experience of allergies and people Absolutely. got hurt or maybe even yeah. died because they ate something. So they made it a rule. So they made the rule. So it, 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 thank you for making that distinction. So a taboo is something that a society or a group of people decides is within possibility or is ruled out as a possibility, right? And so this, this is a almost arbitrary definition of what we can or what we cannot do or let's say that is culture because a group decides right. this is okay and this is not okay and the other thing that i talked about was how comfortable are you individually with a certain food item right so this could yeah. either be within your taboo structure or it could violate all the taboos of the culture in which i grew up or any one of us grew up and we could still be comfortable so what would be did did you growing up have a taboo that was either australian or your extended family culture i think there was a i remember growing up and never being able to be anywhere near raw meat raw, raw meat, meat. Mm -hmm. and it's yes and especially raw fish so um raw fish i kind of got over i we discovered sushi in australia you know, a while ago and it's spectacular but right. I wouldn't have thought, you know, it took me a while. It took me something that uh, I was always warned by my grandmother, you know, make sure things are cooked properly. You know, I, I learned so to cook by my grandmother. Well, was this a family thing or was yeah. this uh, throughout Australia that raw fish is? Mm. I think in general, the older population was just bought up with the fact you had to boil and cook the crap out of everything because there was there was dangerous. There was dangers of. You know, a lack of refrigeration, of course, from the older generation that right. you cooked everything, you salted everything. So there was that kind of old, uh, not old, not old thinking. It was traditional thinking because you just had to do it to survive. You couldn't right. have. But then again, raw meat 
was something I went before I moved to the States, I would never have eaten raw meat. I, it, it was something I never have eaten raw meat. And then, of course, my first date with my wonderful wife, one of my first dates with my wonderful wife, we go to a Polish restaurant. She says, you must try the Tatar. And I, <laughs> so, of course, I'm here trying to impress a girl. <laughs> I'm going to suck it up, baby. And, uh, and so, so I... Only, not only did you get raw meat, did, did they crack an egg over it as well? They did. They cracked no, an egg. And there's, you got and a raw egg with it too. There's a raw egg and there's, and there, you know, and there. And you mix it all with your, the, the, the various condiments, and it was spectacular. Now, I, I, uh, it, that was wonderful. But I did the same to her in Australia because she'd never eaten oysters. Uh -huh. and, I, and I sat down at the table and got a big plate of oysters. And, it, you know, it's a tough thing, oysters, for most people. But putting it in you know, that first one that went into her mouth, it was like I didn't even get a look in. The rest of the plate was gone. <laughs> you know, so it, it was something that once you get over these hurdles, you kind of wonder, well, why the hell didn't we discover this before? But it, it, it sometimes it's so mental, isn't it? It's it, it, I, I think I think yeah. it's mental because it, it it's a belief system that was passed on to us from our elders, right? So when we decide this is good for us and this is not good for us, then it was not a decision we make as kids. This is something that adults probably made the decisions for us um i think the refrigeration piece is is an important part of that puzzle however sushi's been around in japan and many other asian cultures for centuries long before there was artificial re refrigeration so they right. found other ways to keep the the fish fresh enough or they just simply made sure that they ate it the day they caught it um but then you go into european cultures where you find especially in the mediterranean area where there's a lot of uh raw meat like in italy carpaccio like from yeah. from beef, beef carpaccio right um that that is something that is has been around for for quite a while this was not Uh, introduced with the arrival of artificial refrigeration. So what mm. one culture deems as edible, another culture may deem as or consider potentially hazardous to our bodies, right? So I think a lot of the group experiences that a group has around certain food items might be informing some of those rules. And interestingly, all the taboos that we've been talking about or discomforts that we've been talking about so far have only been around animal protein mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah absolutely that's interesting right right so what types of food could you think of you would either outlaw or be uncomfortable with that are not animal-based foods Well, I've experienced okra in the U.S., something I never really had much of an experience with until a friend of mine in the uh, in the South served it up as part of um, also attached to the protein, which was questionable because, you know, he was a bit of a, a wild, a wild roadkill kind of dude. But um, I, it served with okra and uh, fried okra, and it was quite a, a an, an unusual and discomforting consistency for me because when they right. cook it, it gets rather slimy and it... Right. And that there was that kind of it's the it's the texture that got me that time. Not so However, much. However, you taste. did try it, so you you, oh, you did not question whether you're going to put no. it in your mouth because it was plant based, no. right? No, I think that's it's, right. I think it's easy for us as humans to to be grossed out or be be repelled by an an animal to eat an animal if it doesn't fit our mental categories. Would mm. I eat dog meat? Hmm, mm. very unlikely, because I have an emotional Or, or a cerebral connection to horses, uh, uh, dogs as a pet. Likewise with horses. Some right. people might draw the line at a horse because, oh, that's such an intelligent um, animal that we have a human, as humans, we have a relationship with them. Well, whatever your rationale behind it may be. Um, go to Italy, go to Belgium, go to many of the Mediterranean countries. Have you eaten uh, horse salami? I think I brought, I brought a picture of horse salami. Here it is. Salamino di cavallo. Caravallo. It is delicioso. No, that's not Italian. That was Spanish. Um, <laughs> but um, horse salami can be, or, or donkey can be delicious. However, it really depends on whether your environment accepts it as edible, right? And I think it's easier to, to be uh, rigid about yes or no when it comes to animal food. And with plant food, it may not be as much of a challenge for some people. That's just a, a working Absolutely. theory. 
Yeah. Oh, I mean, there's, I mean, so much of this has come up. We didn't really discuss this a lot before the episode, but there's, there's, there's so much we can talk about. And Sue brings up another thing here. Slimy is, is not the favorite food texture. In, in, in fact, Japanese people say that's how they feel about oatmeal. And yet yes. I, I, I love oatmeal and uh, an oatmeal to me, yes, I, I now I think of it, it's a, it's kind of a slimy consistency. Yeah, that sliminess yeah. doesn't bother you, apparently, but oh, fair enough. All right. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. So, and so we, we have a rule in our house, um, and we say, well, you got, if, if it's in front of you, if it's on your plate, you got to at least try it once. If you don't like it, then you can have an educated opinion rather than a bias or prejudice towards the food. Now, yeah. we still decide what we're going to put on the plate, right? So I probably wouldn't introduce horse meat to my family, uh, dog meat to my family. But I've, yeah. I've tried the oysters, and I, I'm not a raw fish fan, to be honest with you. I've tried it. I've given it a, a shot, and I decided, eh, nah, not, yeah. doesn't, doesn't rock my boat. So, But at least we tried it, right? Yeah, well, you know, I grew up being sent down with a jar by my grandmother to the beach and uh, with a, a jar and a, and a screwdriver to go and harvest the oysters on the rocks. And uh, mm. it took us a while to fill the jar up because us kids were just actually eating most of them straight off the rocks. As soon as you open them up, you, you, put, wow. you put that thing in your mouth. And again, that's a slimy consistency, right? So uh, it, it is, I don't know, it, it is it, just it, an interesting yeah. Here we go with slimy or not sanitary, maybe, right? So if yeah. if I go to a grocery store now in the United States, most of the fruit and vegetables, most of the produce are displayed in a very clean environment and they, they are presented to look pretty. Yeah. And it, I've learned to accept that this is the normal that I find here in the United States. In Europe, when I go grocery shopping, it's not always like that, depending on where I go, especially not on markets, open open markets, right? Mm -hmm. And I remember when we were young, when we were kids, my grandparents, they had they had a, a vegetable garden and we would just pluck it from the soil, right? Yeah. We just pluck the carrot or the uh, uh, whatever it was from, from the soil was still dirty and we would just rinse it with a garden hose and that just bite off of it. That probably does not happen as much in in the most U.S. kitchens, right? There's, oh, I need to peel it. I got to make sure it's all uh, no germs on it and whatnot. So there there might be some some taboos or some discomforts around that. Freddy's Vegemite. Uh-huh. Yeah, we know. <laughs> Someone brought it up. I was going to bring it up, but Sue brought it up. Thank you, Sue. I love you. <laughs> All right. Thank so you how much. about this? Are, are you going to eat this, people? Scorpion on a stick, huh? Fried scorpion. scorpion. Who wants that? Yeah. yeah there's, there's, there's a restaurant in uh, in Sydney that specializes in moths, fried moths. Um, and mm. uh, they, they do, a, do a good job of it. And it's actually quite good. It's not What about crickets? Nothing. What about insects in general? Crickets. Come on. Yeah, Frick, it's high perfect. high degree of of a uh, high high dose of protein, right? That should Absolutely. be should be good for us, and it's lower impact on on the world, right? It could be CO two friendlier food development, animal protein. Yeah, would, would you, have you tried crickets? I have not. I have not tried. Well, I've actually I've tried cricket chips. So the, okay. the, the the kind of version of like a tortilla chip made. You mean that's what you eat when you play cricket? That has nothing to do with the animal. <laughs> no, no. Well, maybe not. Uh, but apparently, yeah. But apparently, crickets make very good flour substitutes. So it's mm -hmm. a different, uh, you know. So they can make you can make things out of the flour from not so much eating the the cricket itself, but actually making a substance which can substitute for something else, which is. You know, and, and I often found this in, in Pol going to Poland, a lot of the food that I was served there seemed to be a lot of stuff that was thrown together. And and again, this may be a cultural thing is in a place that has a, you know, a long history of, of, of having periods of time where they've been oppressed by and invaded by different people and cut off from resources. They've had to make do with what they've got. So they've kind of mixed cream you know there's a lot of cream and fat and 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 sustaining types of things that that nowadays like bread and dripping i grew up saying you know my my grand grandparents would say you know you you don't know how good you've got it because we grew up on bread and dripping uh and it was basically bread and fat that was left over right. from the meal yeah. 
But I go to Poland and they and they put that on the table of the best restaurants. Of course, <laughs> you yeah. spread it. You know, it's like. I think that this is this is a, a, a crucial thing. I think the the further removed a society is from the last big trauma or the last big food shortage, let's put it that way, the more picky they become. That that's my theory. So yeah. my grandparents still lived through the horrors of World War II and and the and the deprivation that came after it. Right, and so did many people in Poland and the Russia and the Ukraine and all all through Central and and Eastern Europe. So we as kids grew up being told we need to finish our plate because that leave, leaving something on the plate would almost be like heresy. That's a, a, a sacrilegious. So is that how you say it, the word? Sacrilegious, yeah. Yeah, so you, yeah. you, you must not do that because it, it, it's an insult to the person who prepared the food and to the provider, so to say, because you, you need to eat what's in front of you. Mm. Um, my grandmother would have phrases like, if you don't eat it, we'll, we won't have sunshine tomorrow and stuff like that to make us kids yeah. eat. Um, and so what, what, what becomes part of the everyday cuisine may be viewed as a poor person's meal, right? And often, often the biggest signature dishes come from those scarcity times, right? When, when, yeah. when a group of people develops a, a, a meal that is, is made with what was available and it may not be fancy, it may not be the, the most luxurious item, but it, it, it was made to be delicious out of scarcity. And, and, and sometimes that gets celebrated long after the scarcity times are over. And sometimes those things are a thing of the past. Absolutely. So, I, I was reminded of this, and I was not consciously aware of this when I moved to the United States. So the big one of the big food days for Americans or U.S. Americans is the Thanksgiving holiday. That's when there is a lot of food in most homes. A lot of families have, I mean, the, the tables are bending. That's how much food there is on them. And and typically around turkey and all the stuff that goes around it, maybe some ham. So it's either poultry or, or pork. Those would be the two dominant um, animal proteins that are served. And the first time I was invited to a African-American Thanksgiving celebration, I discovered something that I had not seen in any other Thanksgiving uh, traditions before. And I, I need to back up a little bit, I grew up as the child of a butcher in Germany, right? So I've seen a lot of the slaughtering and the meat processing. So I have a, I have a nose and an eye for it, right? So I walk into this home, African-American family uh, Thanksgiving celebration, and I, I smell something. I was like, this does not smell like turkey. It does also not smell like ham. This reminds me of something. What is it? What is it? Oh, wait a second. There's a huge pot on the stovetop. And every time the lid, somebody opens that lid, that's when I get that whiff of smell. Oh, gosh, I think I know what it is. So none of the other mm, white people or non-black people in the room were aware of this. Only I only saw black people going to that pot and filling their bowl with it. And... My wife comes up to me and says, hey, do you smell this? I said, mm-hmm, check that pot. What is it? What is it? I, said, I would argue these are chitlins. So chitlins are animal test intestines, either right. pork or, or um, beef intestines. So it's the gut, the, the, yeah, the, the, the digestive tract of the animal, and that's cooked in some kind of stew. And it has a very unique smell. And it is a very low-cost protein. And I, I have, had never seen this at a Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is the luxurious, the, the, the abundance, the celebration of we have and not a pot of stuff that you eat if you don't have. Mm. So I asked my host. I took him aside one-on-one -on -one as to not cause any awkwardness, especially not for me. And I said, hey, are these chitlins? And he said, yeah, of course. And I said, hmm, never seen that at Thanksgiving. And he says, how many black Thanksgivings have you been to? I <laughs> said, this is my first one. I said, there you go. This is, and Christina already knows what I'm talking about, tripa, tripe, right? <laughs> yeah, tripa, um, yeah. 
So Flatsky, it's Polish it, Flatsky. They have, I, I wouldn't have eaten tripe before, but Flatsky soup now, you, I will eat a, a bucket of it. <laughs> And the, the the cultural the cultural and historic aspect had struck me, and it was explained to me that even on the highest holiday that we have in the United States, many black families still celebrate it not only with the abundance they have today, but with a reminder of what their ancestors had back in the day when they were enslaved, right, and only got what the master threw at them right so it food can maybe be a taboo throughout the year may be uncomfortable for some people throughout the year but when it comes to a certain occasion it serves as almost a political statement well this, this, kind of, this kind of gets to what hamilton says is that the reason us doesn't eat the more eclectic dishes is because they haven't had real feminine and uh, and i guess i guess mm -hmm. that, that we could just to what you're talking about the, most of the colonized the, or the, the the ones in power, the white people who were, they they may not have had the famine, right? So they right. ate the good, the turkey and all that kind of stuff. Right. But then again, in that context, what you're saying is that the the, the slaves um, in the sla time of slavery, yes, the black people had to do exactly what we're talking about. They had mm -hmm. to make do with what they had and they made... Mm -hmm these wonderful dishes that they're now that they enjoy. And, you know, we probably miss out on because you, you've experienced it. I've experienced it. But many people don't experience these wonderful dishes that uh, that, that have been produced out of these times, right? They're, yep. they're happy accidents, uh, right? Um, wonderful. Wow. This is fantastic. Well, and, and Are you hungry yet? I'm hungry. And I want to go back to Christina. Christina, Marmite, Marmite. I don't know. You know, okay, explain uh, that to me. I'm, I'm an ignorant. <laughs> there's Vegemite and Mar there's Marmite. What's the difference? And, and so for people in the UK, uh, usually Marmite is their, their, their go-to and ours is Vegemite. And there's, there's always this kind of um, rivalry between the two. So Is this a Milo-Milo situation again? It's a Milo-Milo type of thing. Although it's a, Milo and Milo are the same, uh, they're the same thing. In this case, Marmite is, is kind of a poor... A poor interpretation of Vegemite. It's a, it's a treak. It's more like a treacly type of thing. You know, it's just easy for those British people. But you know, Vegemite, Vegemite, it puts hair on your chest. <laughs> well, you know, if you're a man. <laughs> I must have had a lot of that. All right. Um, <laughs> gosh. So no Marmite and Vegemite is a thing. All right. Good. Um, but Christine says that it actually does not taste bad. I'm, I'm presuming you're talking to Marmite. It does not taste bad if you don't think about what you're eating. Or well, I guess if we didn't think about what we're eating. Anyway, and I guess that this gets back to the time of if if you are really, seriously, if you're, if you're living under um, uh, famine and you don't have a lot, mm -hmm. you you basically, you know, try to switch off these things just through through pure survival. Right. And obviously, sometimes that's brought about these happy accidents of finding wonderful things that are really great and nutritious. So, yeah. And and I, I want to go back to this, and and the, 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 because I never really thought about this as much, because I'm still a meat eater, uh, much to the chagrin of my oldest daughter, who was trying to educate me to change my habits. Um, we 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 as humans seem to be much more hung up on on these food comfort levels around animals with, mm. with with plants it doesn't seem to be much of an issue but the, no. the one thing i could think of is, is maybe have you had stinky tofu no i don't i've never really done tofu a lot because i'm a meat guy too so I'd, i've never really had to i always see tofu as a as a replacement but i've never done done any kind of thing like that right yeah. So there, there, there's. I think when when it comes to to smells, I think when our olfactory systems send alarms up our brains, say, "Hey, this smells like decay, or this smells like something right. is rotting. This could be potentially harmful to our system." I think that's when a lot of our our rejection comes from. It's um, if you don't know that you're eating horse meat, dog meat, or uh, I don't know, uh, goat goat or chimpanzee brain i don't know what it is if right. you don't know what that is and if it's well prepared you probably wouldn't have an issue with it until afterwards yeah uh, until somebody told you but i think if if it's a if the smell is 
somewhat alerting or alarming that may cause that response more, I guess. Well, it, 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 growing up, my wife had mutton. Yeah. So sheep. Yep. And But in Australia, lamb is a delicacy. So the oh, yeah. smell of cooking of cooking lamb to her it kind of does that but when she tastes it it's a different thing i have that i, I have that visceral reaction to tongue and mm -hmm. and and kidneys and thing and kidney and things Intestines like that in general i guess right and, and, and again we're talking about meat you know we're, we're getting back on this meat it is the it is that and i mean what about the swedish gefilte fish so these kind of where you have literally rot it's like rotten fish you know in a can and you know, so you can't even be, some people can't even be within 20 feet of it. Yes. Uh, and, and yet people eat that. Uh, kimchi, kimchi from the Koreans, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Good partially, stuff. Partially, right, great stuff. I mean, great on omelets for breakfast. I never thought I'd eat kimchi for breakfast, but it, it's the best time of the day to eat it. Anyway. Oh, Sue brings up something that I, I, oh, I need yes. to settle this for once and all. Okay. Oh, Sue, oh, I think it's that way cilantro or coriander seems to be something that hits people very differently i'm gonna yeah. go out on a limb if you don't like cilantro slash coriander you don't need to talk to me <laughs> oh <laughs> cilantro is awesome <laughs> yeah that's a that that's def definitely a 50 50 thing <laughs> it's like the devil's food to some people <laughs> <laughs> By the way, th this is th this is interesting because uh, I'm I'm happy that Sue's brought it up because cilantro and coriander may be perceived as two different things. Cilantro is the green stuff that you see growing out of the ground. It looks a little bit like parsley, and coriander is often referred to as the seeds of that plant. Mm -hmm. So, in my okay. native culture, in in Germany, cilantro as an herb is almost non-existent and most people who tried is I, I tried it in my family i presented to them a dish made with fresh cilantro and like yeah man yeah what do you try yeah. <laughs> however cor coriander seeds you you'll find really nice breads a big loaf of german bread you know big chunks of spicy bread sometimes with curry whole coriander seeds baked into the dough mm -hmm. nobody will have an issue with that so same plant different experience yeah that's right. And then right. If, you're a pan, if you're a panda bear, you're the only one that can eat bamboo and they can have it. <laughs> so. I want my bamboo. No, now I'm hungry. So uh, wherever Come in the on. world you are. So for me, it's lunchtime. For you, it might be breakfast or it might be dinner time. I don't care. Um, tell us in the comments what – actually, I want to know what your favorite food, not in general, is. So what you ate today. Put it in there, what yeah. you ate today or what you will be eating today. Put that in the comments. Let us know um, what it is you plan on eating or have been eating today. And it filled you up and it um, served your body and nurtured you to do to be the best person you can be today. Absolutely. That's what we're about. Thank you, everybody. What a great. Oh, this is fun. Well, you could go on like this forever. Um Maybe yeah. So put put your comments, questions, anything in the uh, in the uh, in the chats, and um, we thank you again. Grateful, do consider obviously um, subscribing to our channels and uh, okay. keep yourself alerted to when we're live, which is actually every day. It might be different times, but it's different times because we're trying to uh, match the maybe the good meal. Maybe we, yeah. See, that's the problem. We didn't actually consider meal times when we went live here. We could have, you know, put somebody off their meal, and I'm, we're sorry about um, that. <laughs> ah, come on, mushroom risotto, Christiana, Christina. Oh, yeah. That would be lovely. That would be lovely. I love, uh, mm. yeah, mushroom. mushrooms are great. Yeah. All right. Yeah. All right. <laughs> See you all tomorrow. Well fed, I hope. And then we could talk about what we drink or what we don't drink. No, that's another episode. That's another episode. We could bring drinks for that. <laughs> All right, guys. <laughs> See you later. Bye.